The educator Dr. Maria Montessori once said, The child developing harmoniously and the adult improving himself at his side make a very exciting and attractive picture. Welcome to Montessori Education with me, Jesse McCarthy, where we talk raising children and educating students while bettering ourselves right alongside them. How do I become a Montessori teacher? I've gotten this question a few times over the past year, and in, in answering it on this episode of the show, I'm going to change the question slightly to, how do I become a great Montessori teacher? Because no one really at the end of the day wants to be average. We all strive to do our work really well. So on this episode, we'll aim high to get to greatness in a way. Okay, so the first step, uh, and I'm going to be sharing four steps in total, is to start at what many might view as you know the bottom. So become an assistant first is the first step I'm giving you to become a great Montessori teacher. Now I don't think of this role, you know, an assistant as the bottom in some moral or you know worth sense, but just meaning it's an entry point into education. Now, before I get into this directly, I'll share a story from my early days. This is even before becoming somewhat of a classroom assistant myself. So before getting into education, I was I thought maybe I'd get into business. And one organization, which was a restaurant, was called uh, Wahoo's Fish Tacos. <laughs> I just happened to really enjoy every time I'd walk in the place people were just so excited so when I graduated college I just reached out to I don't know if like wahoo info at wahoos.com or something like that and I said listen I just graduated college um, I really love your company I want to get I want to go all the way up I want to get see what it's all about and maybe becomes you know a great manager or a restaurant owner myself one day so I just said but I'm willing to start you know at the bottom if necessary even as a dishwasher So the idea was that I just wanted to get in there, see what's going on, see if I like it actually too, but just get an entry point. So in my case, it was like the dishwasher or the cashier or something like that. And I mean, it ended up working out really well. Uh, I didn't end up, you know, working at Wahoo's all my life. I teach and became my passion, uh, which is a different story, but it was really great to go in that way. And it was an incredible experience to see the whole workings of the restaurant without all the responsibility of taking care of the restaurant. So just really washing dishes or taking care of the cashier, the cat, you know, just the whole front area of the restaurant. So anyways, the equivalent in the classroom to what I was doing in the beginning there at Oahu's is an assistant there. It's you're basically there to aid the teacher, um, the head teacher with the children, but you're not responsible for the whole classroom like a head teacher is. Now, because you don't have to be responsible for everything, you're able to have a unique comp, which hopefully allows for some significant absorbing. So like you can absorb what's going on all around you. In a good Montessori classroom, much of your role as an assistant is actually just observing. So you're free to start to really understand children through observation. So through seeing what excites them daily, what upsets them, what bores them, you know, all that kind of stuff. You get to take in so much as an assistant and you don't have to take also, you don't have to have the stress that can sometimes come with being a lead teacher. So generally my advice to become an assistant first is about your getting around children as much as possible and being able to observe them without a lot of, you know, kind of baggage or weight about you having to be this or that. You're an assistant. Okay. So it's, if you can have much of that time early on in your career, but without, again, having the weight of full responsibility for the classroom, it's, I mean, it's all the better. So the first step is I recommend is to become an assistant. All right. Second step, read. And I mean, read a lot. So first and foremost, read Maria Montessori's works. Uh, A couple quick recommendations that I like. So the first is if you enjoy kind of tough but enlightening reading, my personal favorite is Montessori's California Lectures of 1915. So she gave these lectures in California and then, you know, somebody transcribed them and they're in a book form. Uh, Here's a quick excerpt that I, I just love. 
Quote, Let us imagine ourselves among a race of giants who differ from us in proportion as we differ from the child, and we ourselves are forced to use the giant's furniture. So dishes, possessions. If we want to sit down, we have to climb onto a chair with our hands and feet. If we want to move the chair, we have to climb down the same way and move this great weight. We want to wash our hands, but the sink is like a big bathtub. It takes two hands to use a hairbrush. Everything is so high that we cannot use anything without asking for help. Doors to open, hooks on which to hang our clothes and other things. We are unable to do things we need to do, and we feel the humiliation resulting from our failure to act. We certainly would disdain these giant people and not wish to live with them if we knew they had prepared nothing so we might act. Okay, so that's, I mean, it's kind of, she gives this little abstract example. I mean, it's kind of an analogy with giants and adults. Um, something that just came to mind as I'm reading this is when I was a teacher at this kind of private school, it was more, a little more traditional. Um, I remember one day after doing a lot of reading in Montessori, I wasn't yet trained. Um, I remember just one of the kids was raising his hand to go to the bathroom in class. And it just struck me like this kid, he must have been like 13, 14 years old. And he has to raise his hand to go to the bathroom. Like it's, it just hit me how bizarre that was. And it's kind of, it's reminding me of it in this example, because it's like the child needs us to do everything, the giant, you know, or if we were the adult and there's the giant, we need that giant to do everything for us. It's a horrible feeling, horrible. So uh, this, the California lectures really had an impact on me early on. I mean, literally like 15 years ago, it was just, it was such a powerful book. It was the, it was one of the first books I read of hers and it just had such an impact. So anyways, it stayed with me. Now, if you want a quicker and easier read of Montessori's just to begin, I recommend, recommend a relatively new book that compiles some of her brief articles to parents actually. So it's called Maria Montessori Speaks to Parents. Now, although it's technically for parents, I think it will give you a good sense of how Montessori views children. So if you're kind of new to this, it's, it's, I see it as helpful. Um, now, I recommend reading Montessori directly is, you know, I'm, the kind of, I'm the type who first likes to go to the source. So when everybody's telling, you know, let's say on the news, somebody's like, oh, this guy is this way and this woman, she's horrible. What I like to do is just go read them directly. What have they said? So that's why I think I recommend going to Montessori directly. Uh, but I, found, I know she can be dense for some. So if you want a solid presentation of Montessori's work, by, but by someone else, maybe try The Science Behind the Genius by Angeline Lillard. Uh, it's still a real read. Like, it's not easy reading, but it's a bit academic at times, actually. But it's, I think it's a unique presentation of what's kind of true and good about Montessori schooling. So there's one quick book uh, I recommend. Okay, and then second, in terms of books, I this is a book I only wish I'd found when I started my career, and that is Between Parent and Child by the late Dr. Heim Gannat. I recommend this book a lot, and I am never going to stop recommending it. It's so helpful. Uh, there, I, There's no one better today at understanding children's emotions than Dr. Gannat, I'm, at least from my vantage. And I've read a lot. I've seen a lot. I've been around a lot of children and adults. I, He's the best. Uh, quick note. Let me think about this here. Uh, I, I Personally, I learned of the effectiveness and the truth of most of what, you know, Haim Gannad and Maria Montessori in particular taught through experience. So I was, I was basically working at the same time as a teacher. So ideally, you will be reading while working with children. Now, that's why my suggestion to, you know, read a lot is the second step and it comes after or you know simultaneously at the same time as the first so becoming an assistant so read but do the work be an assistant at the same time teach at the same time Um, reading is just i love to read but it is not a replacement for experience and not even close okay so two steps there third step get trained and find a mentor so I, again, I taught in a relatively traditional private school and for years before being trained. Now, I think I gained so much, f- interestingly, from not having the training too early. 
Because this way I approach children. I had no preconceived ideas about what I, you know, should be like as a teacher or as a, even as a Montessori teacher. Like I didn't do teacher training. I just started working with children. Um, now, I don't think it's always necessary to get experience before being trained. Like I know some people that are that became great teachers and, you know, they were trained straight out of college. Uh, but I I think it really helps greatly. So I, I recommend that. And the reason is I found that many individuals who you get trained to be teachers before actually working with children, they tend to have difficulties. And so like for one, some of them wind up thinking they already know everything because they've been trained officially. But what happens is in practice, they're, they often become a big mess in the classroom. So they think they know everything and then they become a mess, you know, their first, second year. Now, this can happen because from what I found in working with so many of these teachers, helping them through those first years, you thinking about it myself, um, it, it happens often because what people will do is they get trained and then they create an ideal image you know, that comes somewhat from training of what they should be like. And also how children should be like. But of course, when they're hit with the reality of like the day-to-day -day work in the classroom, the children and they themselves don't necessarily live up to their ideal or theoretical expectations of what they should be like as a teacher, or what children should be like as, you know, these great children. Um, and that's tough. So, it, but in contrast, if you've been an assistant in a classroom before being trained, you get to see the, the, you know, the actual ups and downs of a real life classroom. So often training, although the, it's a phenomenal, and we'll talk about training in a second, it doesn't have much usually on handling conflict. And conflict between children and even with children and, and you as an adult, that winds up being really important and it takes up a lot of time. Um, so anyways, with experience first, you have some sense of what to expect when it's your turn to be, you know, the responsible lead teacher in the classroom. Now, a practical question here, which training to get? And boy, you know, it can be a mess out there in terms of trainings. I mean, in thinking about trainings today, I decided, oh, I'll just do a quick Google search of what's available out there. You know, I know a, a bunch of trainings, but, you know, well, let's see what's out there. And there are literally hundreds of trainings from, you know, like huge worldwide organizations and trainings all the way down to small schools doing their own little seminars. Okay. Now, personally, again, I like to go to the source and in trainings, that means AMI, which is the Association Montessori International. And this is what Maria Montessori herself started. So I was trained AMI myself in San Diego, California, um, but there are AMI training centers all over America and then, you know, throughout the world. Uh, but I'll say this, having just recommended AMI, note that Maria Montessori, sadly, in my view, I would have loved to meet the woman. She's long deceased. So her being the source of this organization doesn't really guarantee anything at this point. It's been so long. So I, I do still think it's the safest bet in trainings with AMS training probably coming in second. So AMS is the American Montessori Society, and this is the most popular training in America by far. So just by numbers wise. Now, I'm not going to say much about them. You can Google them and, and you know talk to others. But beyond these two, I, I can't offer much guidance because you know, I imagine there is there might be like a 50 year veteran Montessori teacher out there who's just, I mean, phenomenal, given lessons in her house somewhere. And she might very well be better than all the rest, but I just don't know. So you're going to have to do a lot of research, but I'm just saying that AMI and AMS are the most known. I was trained in AMI and then there's hundreds of others out there. So my greatest guidance is for you to do your own research. And this is that independent thinking. I mean, th think beyond just organizations. You know, for instance, like ask other Montessori teachers that you know or you can you know, get a hold of, get a sense of whom they admire most and ask them why. And if possible, like seek a trainer that you can admire in some way, whether it's their writings or a video you saw, something like that. I mean, and just as 
sometimes just a seemingly like an upright human being. It doesn't have to be their their, their most amazing teacher you've ever seen, although that would be nice. Um, but they're just like an, a stand up individual. Like you don't want a jerk being your trainer. Um, you don't want some some woman or man that's just you know yelling. I mean, you know you get the point. Like you want somebody you can look up to, um, and then get trained by that person. For ultimately, like who your trainer is will really determine how good the training is. So just because you hear something about this big name of a training center or something like that, do your research. Who is the trainer going to be, right? All right. And I should say, interestingly, this is actually the same advice I give to high school students who are thinking about college. Uh, You want to look for the great, insightful professors in your area of, of interest or, you know, what you want to you know, work on long range and then pick a school based on where they are at. Because again, for the most part, everything else is really secondary. They're going to be your, your teacher, your professor, your mentor, maybe not your mentor, but they're going to be your main teacher. Um, Okay. And then related here in terms of finding an actual mentor, this doesn't have to be your trainer, but I'm just talking about mentors in general, in general. Try to look for a good teacher at a local Montessori school. That would be my suggestion, if you don't know of anybody already. Um, Now, he or she doesn't have to be a superstar. At this point, you're just searching out someone who has more knowledge and experience than you do and who is also willing to help you get better. So go find someone like that who knows what they're doing, but they don't have, again, they don't have to have like, you know, 70 years experience in the classroom or something and just absorb all you can from that individual. Now I mentioned getting a mentor because your training is really just the beginning. My training was just the beginning. It's so much easier, like even after you get trained to improve when you have someone you can turn to who has done it before and whom you can ask all sorts of questions that will inevitably inevitably come up along the way. Uh, there's, there's this related quote I love. Let me get it here. Uh, it's from the ancient Greek historian Polybius. So he said, quote, there are two ways by which all men may reform themselves, so how they'll get better, either by learning from their own errors or from those of others. The former makes a more striking demonstration, the latter a less painful one. Okay, so in other words, we should all learn from other people's mistakes as much as we possibly can so that we don't have to constantly feel the pain of our own. So find a mentor for yourself. Just search one out. All right, that was the three steps. So step four, do the work. So get a job as a head teacher and also stick it out. Uh, this is this will not be easy. Like beginning at something never is. And with teachers in particular, sometimes they think that just, you know, oh, caring about children, that's all you need or something like that. That is that is not true. Like, as the wisest, most experienced teachers and parents will tell you, love is not enough. You also need understanding to, to really be successful, and that comes through experience. Again, doing the hard work. Like In the history of great teachers, there has never been a single one who was born great. I mean, never, ever. As, as Montessori put it, and this is in a different context, but I like this quote here, quote, a man does not just happen. He does not just grow like a flower. And end of quote. And the same is true of a teacher. Like great ch- teachers develop their greatness over years of practice and iteration of learning from past errors and getting better and better with each each day and each lesson learned. So bottom line, there there is absolutely no substitute for experience as a head teacher. If, if you can make it through your first, I'd say three or four years, you will be on the way to becoming something incredible with children when you put when you put that work in. Now if now if you expect to be great your first or second year as a teacher, I'm going to tell you right now, you will probably burn out or like at the least you will spend restless, 
and wasteful nights beating yourself up for not being, quote, good enough. So just skip the idea that you will be a perfect teacher right out the gate and know that instead you will be doing some serious development along the way. It's tough to, it's it's easier said than done, but I mean, embrace the sometimes messy work of growth. This is both in the children and in yourself. All right. So those are the four steps. Again, so we got step one, become an assistant. Step two, read a lot. Step three, get trained and find a mentor. And step four, do the work. Get a job as a head teacher and stick it out. So if you have any questions or comments about these steps or you know about your own journey, just write in. So you can reach me at jesse, J-E-S-S-E, at montessorieducation.com. And incidentally, if you are enjoying this podcast overall, please take a minute to rate the show or leave a positive comment. Like it's really helpful for spreading the word. And I'd say it's just it's just also rewarding to hear from you. I mean, like I'm sitting up here half the time, like I'm speaking to a microphone. And of course, it does not say much of anything back to me, right? Okay. And, uh, you know, one last personal thing for all the future great teachers out there. And I know they are out there. Through the years, like, I've heard a lot of educators say that the best part of their work is seeing former students years later as successful grownups. Now, I really enjoy this too. I mean, it's pretty awesome. I mean, I've seen like third graders and then they'll, you know, years later they drive up in their car and I'm like, oh my God, how is this possible? You know, and it's, it's very cool to see. But as much as I'm happy to have an impact on children for the long ran, range, you know, to see them successful years and years later, my favorite part of being a teacher has always been the everyday teaching. And, and that includes the learning and growing myself right alongside the children I'm working with. And this is in the present, in the now. Um, and of course, now the same is true in my work with adults. If, if I didn't myself love this process of teaching like the most, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing it. I wouldn't be in this profession. Now, I'm noting this here because I remember as a young teacher, like people would tell me, I'd go to parties or the you know, cocktail things, and they'd say, oh, it's so noble of you to, you know, to give your life for children. You know, and and you're, I was supposed to feel good about this, I, I'm assuming. Um, I never really connected with these kind of comments. Like, and I think it's in, in large part because I didn't see my work as some kind of sacrifice. Like, ultimately, I think we will do the best by children when we are doing the best by ourselves too. So whether you become a, a great teacher in the long run or ultimately decide the profession is just not for you, which might happen, and that's that's cool too, that's fine. My greatest wish like for everyone listening is that you make the most out of your unique journey. Like just trying to enjoy as much of it as you possibly can. It's It's ridiculously cliche, to say, but I mean, we really do only live once. 